Greg Mellick with us, with Ed Hyman and Nancy Lazar, ISI. Let's bring him in to talk retail with great notes. Really, I, I must say, terrific notes. I did not buy this online. I went over to Madison Avenue at one of those fancy stores. Are, are stores going to be around in five or ten years? They're going to be around in five or ten years, but they're not going to have the share they have today. Your margin statistics are remarkable, not the absolute level of retail traditional stores, but at the margin, the future growth, it's remarkable how much is going to Internet. Yeah, we, right now retail sales, uh, about 6% were on, online last year. Uh, as that CAGRs from 14% growth moves up to about 19 or 20% the next few years, we think about a third of retail sales growth by 2015 will actually be online. Is it, is it stable growth now, or is there an actual acceleration of the acceleration? It, it's important to watch because it appears to be that there's an acceleration yeah. going on, but it's still early days. But we think what's driving it is mobile commerce. The, the development of smartphones where people now have the Internet in their pocket is, I think, what's creating that acceleration in mobile commerce. In, in, in what way do you mean that? They're, they're buying well, now, off their cell phone? You can buy off your cell phone and at a minimum, you can actually uh, just do at least a price check. So yeah, it's making people go home and research, do stuff. Yeah. That's right. Uh, and, but uh, <clears throat> just in our own survey work suggests uh, that last year, uh, over 20% of Americans said that had a smartphone had said they had used it to buy at least two products online through the year. Mm -hmm. So that means about 7 or 8% of Americans did that last year. Let's look at an economist versus a guy looking at the stock here. This is CIBC uh, World Markets, the note of the day. And this is what we see. Emmanuel Anajor up in Toronto, CIBC World Markets. Consumer demand in the U.S. is showing signs of weakening, slightly bearish on Treasury, supportive for consumer-related equities. What a mixed report today. What did you take away from it? Well, uh, the retail sales numbers actually looked a little better than yes. we were expecting. And I think what you saw was that the, uh, the chain store guys that come out uh, just over a week ago are really very apparel dominant. And that was weather influence. And we saw as home improvement, a few other categories really come through better and picking up in May than we think the market expected. Yeah, give me chart six, if you would, here, uh, Rex. I want to show here this V shaped. This is one of the ultimate V shaped recoveries. Retail's terrible, gloom, down it goes. I'm sorry. If you'd asked me two years ago, I would have said that line wouldn't go up. Ed Hyman's been cautious on the economy. Uh, you know, all in all, look at the retail juggernaut that is. Well, I think a lot of it is what we're used to, right? So in the past, if you look at that retail number and go back 25 years, it's averaged about 5.5% nominal growth. And we did get back to that last year. But normally when you're coming out of that V, you would have expected maybe a couple hundred bips even better than that V. So we actually, our lead indicators do suggest that things will slow a little bit uh, through the, the back half of the mm -hmm. year to about 4% growth. But Talk still, to, still not yeah. bad. Talk to Dana. We talked wedges with Dana Telsey this morning on Bloomberg Surveillance. Earlier this morning, we did speak uh, with Ms. Telsey, uh, and we talked uh, about online shopping sites and how they're taking over more regional growth. They're taking over regional space. What you're seeing is traditional retailers are investing in online and addressing ways to make it complementary to their business. It has to be a win-win for all. I think the convenience of shopping online, given the increased selection, and now the competitiveness of free shipping, it's making online being a true option. Not everyone is the store's generation, and that's why retail needs to advance into the other channels of distribution. I mean, a nice overview there. Who's winning this battle? Well, it, it really goes category by category. I think if you look at certain names uh, on the hardline side, Williams Sonoma has done a good job of trying to build their catalog business, which mm -hmm. they had historically, and really take that to online. So now over 40% of their sales are either online or through catalog, not going through a Amazing. store. Uh, but they're, you know, basically it's all about every retailer owning their customer. If you have the right assortment, you have the right price, and you have the right service, you can carry them online. And I think that's the that's message that we give all the retailers. You can bring them right over well. online. That's, that's got to be the end goal. It, yet, retailers need to think about it differently. It's not about having more stores and more space, pushing more volume through it. It's not <clears> piled <throat> high and let it fly anymore. Right. Now it's about owning that customer, getting them what they need, what they want, where they want it, and how they want it. Uh, and online's a key part of that. Uh, online upscale. Let's start with that. The president of Saks Fifth Avenue sat in his chair recently, and he said they're going for exclusive. You can only get it at Saks, item after item. I see it in the store down uh, on Fifth Avenue as well. Is, 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 is upscale doing 
doing well? Uh, upscale is definitely doing better. We think it has as much to do with the fact that the upscale consumer is doing better. I mean, right. they're, they're a balance sheet consumer. They're not as dependent on income and gas prices and hurt them as much. And certainly stock market going up helps their uh, confidence more mm -hmm. than, than the average consumer. Uh, but a key brands, I mean, Saks is a brand. Uh, Ralph Lauren, Omar Saad just joined our team uh, about a month ago. And that's one of his top names and one of ours because if you have a brand that owns the customer, whether they buy it through a store, whether they buy it through a department store, whether they buy it through Polo's own store or buy it online, it doesn't matter. The consumer will go for the product they want. Here's the, I, I was stunned by this chart. Bring this up right now. Elegant chart. Uh, wow. The creative destruction, thank you, Joseph Schumpeter, of traditional retail. There's Amazon normalized back five years with Macy's. Who would want to own Macy's? I mean, I, and I use them just as an example. Well, uh, we don't. We don't officially cover Macy's, so, but 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 generally speaking, what Amazon's doing is they're about you know, close to half of that online sales growth. So the the, the point is they're the, the key simple play, but it doesn't mean there aren't other retailers that can't migrate themselves on there. Uh, what I would point is that chart you showed over the last five years is another way that retailers can create value for their shareholders. AutoZone, if you put up their stock chart over the last five years versus Amazon and Apple, it's sort of right in the middle of it. Yeah. So if you recognize that you have a core franchise with your customer, it doesn't mean because you're a traditional retailer you can't win and do well. It's, it's making sure you're ahead of that curve. I, I saw an article maybe in the journal here a couple of days ago. They're not called malls anymore. They got a new what, name for them. I can't remember. What do we call malls I don't now? Know, there, there's something new what, name for malls or something. A place where you take pictures of products and buy them online? I think that would be, yeah, that would, <laughs> you call it my act, huh? Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, what are, what's going to happen with malls? Uh, look, we're, it, the best malls will actually be, we think, in in, uh, in a better position because there's still an experience of going around and seeing all the assortment live and checking it all out. We think where the real pressure ends up being is on the weaker malls. So the A malls, uh, where there's an Apple store where it's a traffic driver and people want to be there as part of a mm -hmm. social experience, I think they do fine. Uh, it's the ones where there's true excess capacity, sort of C malls, you know, just... Does Flint, Michigan, you know, how many malls do they really need at the end of the day? Can the guy who made Apple stores go over and save J.C. Penney? Well, you're going right to the news. Uh, uh, you know, look, he's got a great track record both at, uh, at Target and what he's done with Apple's retail stores. It's a big leap, certainly, yeah. from selling a, a product line like Apple uh, to going to J.C. Penney. Uh, we're here with Greg Millick, ISI. We look at retail. America, let's look at Ron Johnson moving J.C. Penney. Bring it in here, uh, Victor, if you would. Here's the intraday chart, 31 days back. And up we go, and this is just simply guy that made Apple's wonderful retail juggernaut up to here, 30 to 35. Not bad. I mean, it's a really remarkable story, the Apple retail. We look at it as, as fans. You're a, a financial guy. When you look at Apple retail, what do you think of? Well, to me, what's impressive about it is uh, you sort of redefine the shopping experience. The consumer comes in and they work with one person and takes them through the product and will actually check them out. And I think that much more seamless experience is something that consumers are looking for. We've even seen other retailers, such as Home Depot and Lowe's, now move towards having mobile checkout in the store. Right. And I think that's trying to take some of that learning. Uh, you know, why make well, people drag something people to the learned, checkout? What have people in the industry learned from Mr. Johnson. Well, I think uh, well, Apple's also special in terms of the product it has and the loyalty it has. So uh, it's taking that loyalty that people have to want to go to the store and then make the shopping experience better and more holistic to keep growing share. I mean, I cover Best Buy, and one of my biggest concerns with Best Buy is the Apple retail stores. It's now the third largest CE retailer in the country through its own stores. Here's a chart here of Best Buy. Let's go right to it. Nice segue there, Greg Mellick. Yeah. Creative destruction will accelerate. I mean, that's, that, that chart looks almost like Goldman Sachs, to be honest. I talk about a rollover <laughs> in the last four years. Give me an update on Best Buy. Well, look, Best Buy just reported numbers today. Yeah. Uh, they weren't bad. The comps are still negative, but they improved a bit sequentially. Uh, but their gross margin slipped 60 bips, bips. So I think the point is is that to get the top line or even to stop it from getting worse, they've had to give up on gross margin. That's sort of the right. fundamental problem of being the market share leader when Amazon's gaining share and Apple's gaining share. Okay. Uh, Lisa Murphy got mad at me. I said, do you shop at Talbot's? And I got one of these looks like this. Let's bring up Talbot's here. Bring up this chart. The Talbot's. It's like, it's like where my mother shot. My mother used to love this thing. What a train. I mean, how do you put bad concepts in retail out of their misery? I mean, this has been a challenge, to say the least. Clo if you don't get the clothing equation right, mm -hmm. the merchandising, it's ugly, isn't it? 
Well, look, every part of retail is different, but uh, Omar is certainly our chief. Next time we're going to have him here for lunch, and we'll get into that in detail, Tom. But I, I would say with any retailer, I, it, I think Greg it just takes, in, oh, that's a break exclusive. Greg invited it, Omar over to the show. I right, love that because he's the guy that knows that in and out. Yeah. At the end of the day, a retailers take a long time to die because there is some residual traffic, and typically, yes. if they have a store position, a market position, there's a slow decay rate to it. That's why they take a long time to die. Uh, they just go on and on. Yeah. Uh, let, let's, let's go back to the, the mall idea, the department store idea. What do we need to know about department stores right now? I, I get a hit or miss feeling. Well, look, it, 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 department stores have gone through a massive consolidation. If you think of the way we shopped 20 years ago, you used to buy electronics in a department store. You don't do that anymore. You used to buy, uh, well, I guess you could at Sears, but they're not selling too many TVs anymore. So with the exception of Sears, just all about all those hard goods have left yeah. the mall. And department stores now have maybe 3 or 4% share of retail sales, which is half of what they were 15, 20 years ago. So that shift has sort of taken place, and department stores have become uh, really apparel retailers. You know, that, that, that have a, right. a bunch of different apparel departments. We got to have you and Omar back. I love this phrase overstored or under demolished. And it we, really says we it all. argue under demolished. Under demolished. Just get rid of them and, and let's uh, move on. Greg Miller, thank you so much with uh, ISI.